My name is Jason Staggs. Um, this is my first, uh, second time here at DEF CON. I was here last year at DEF CON 20. I uh, had a great time, met a lot of really cool people doing some really interesting stuff. And I'm um, just glad to be back again here this year to uh, uh, really live the experience. So the title of my talk is How to Hack Your Mini Cooper, uh, Reverse Engineering Controller Area Network Messages on Passenger Automobiles. <clears throat> uh, so a little bit about me. Um, first and foremost, I am a, a graduate student of computer science at the Institute um, for Information Security at TU. Yeah. Um, right on. Uh, I'm also uh, currently finishing up my master's uh, thesis um, related to drive-by download attack mitigation. Um, I also have very strong research interests in network intrusion detection systems and uh, critical infrastructure protection, um, digital forensics, and most recently uh, vehicle network security, uh, which I carry out through TU's Crash Reconstruction Research Consortium, um, which is directed by uh, Dr. Jeremy Daly, who's actually a professor of mechanical engineering, um, who quite literally wrote the book on um, automotive uh, collision uh, reconstruction fundamentals. Um, so we're very fortunate to have somebody with his caliber of expertise um, leading those efforts. And then before I came to TU, I was actually a, a cybersecurity analyst for uh, an information security firm in Tulsa, Oklahoma uh, called True Digital Security. So who here in the audience remembers uh, Tim Burton's Batman Returns from like the early 90s? Okay, several of you. Good, good. Um, there's a scene actually in the movie where Batman parks his Batmobile um, behind a building in a back alley somewhere. Um, he then leaves it and takes off to, you know, attend to his crime fighting business. Um, and then all of a sudden, the uh, penguin um, and his gangster thugs sort of stumble across the Batmobile and um, they start playing with it. They start taking things apart. And then all of a sudden, they attach a, a little wireless gizmo to the Batmobile um, designed to interface with the actual computer systems on the car. Um, they basically reassemble everything, they take off, Batman comes back later on that night, um, hops in his Batmobile and goes off and leaves. Um, and then all of a sudden the penguin kind of appears on the infotainment screen and says, gentlemen, start your engines. And then from that point forward, Batman is frantically trying to stomp on the brake pedal um, and as the penguin is um, basically wreaking, uh, wrecking havoc on the citizens of Gotham City. Um, a scenario such as that back then was somewhat near impossible um, considering all the mechanical devices that were used to control the various um, components of the vehicle. Um, but today a scenario such as that is actually ve uh, fairly realistic. Um, so what originally got me interested in vehicle network security um, was some research that was put out by the University of Washington and the University of California San Diego back in 2010 and 2011. Um, what they did originally was they actually did an empirical study um, to see how resilient um, the computer systems on vehicles were um, to digital attacks. Um, and the short answer to that is they're not too resilient whatsoever. Surprise, surprise. Um, so in their first paper, they actually were able to compromise various systems on the automobile, um, assuming the, phys the attacker had physical access to the bus. Um, you know, what all could they do? And they were able to take full control of, like I said, the brakes, uh, the accelerator pedal, um, body control mechanisms such as the locks, um, interior and exterior lighting, um, basically everything. Um, they later, later received some criticism from um, automotive manufacturers saying, yeah, well, you were able to do that, but you had physical access to the car anyways. Why not just cut the brake lines? Well, okay. Um, so the following year, they put out some more research. Um, basically, they were able to carry out the same types of attacks. Um, uh, basically uh, by um, uh, um, <clears throat> taking advantage of some um, vulnerabilities in some uh, shortwave radio communication um, such as Bluetooth and a telemetry uh, device. <clears throat> um, so at TU, you know, we're interested in doing this type of research as well. Um, we also do um, chip level forensics on ECUs, so the actual systems um, on the actual um, vehicle networks themselves. Um, we also <coughs> uh, assess the accuracy of the actual pre-crash and crash data stored on event data recorders, so the little black boxes that automobiles contain. And then we want to we be able to understand these systems and networks at a very low level and be able to understand the potential points of vulnerability um, on these systems and networks. 
Uh, but most importantly, we want to we want to be able to prevent um, something like this from turning into this um, because of this. Uh, so what you guys are looking at right here on the table, I'm sure a lot of you can't see it in the back. Um, what we're calling it is the can clock. Um, it was actually a project that was the outcome of a research-driven um, class that I was involved with last semester called Vehicle Communication Systems. Um, that was uh, co-taught by Dr. Daly and Dr. Mauricio Papa, who is a computer scientist and um, who specializes in uh, computer networks. Um, it was designed originally as a proof of concept uh, to demonstrate that uh, you know what a rogue ECU device could do um, if it was attached to a CAN bus. Um, and the overall goal was to actually transform um, the instrument cluster up from the Mini Cooper um, into a functional clock. Um, so uh, there was literally two problems. Um, actually, I know I had no prior knowledge to how these systems work beforehand. So I had to build a CAN bus from scratch. And then also, um, with passenger automobiles, the actual message IDs themselves that are responsible for controlling the various devices and functionality of the systems on the vehicle are proprietary in nature. Um, so um, some reverse engineering methods were used um, to identify the message IDs themselves. Um, so it's actually quite common for um, vehicles to have multiple types of networks um, in place on these um, vehicles. Um, if you have a car that was manufactured on or after 2008, um, then by law you actually have CAN, um, whether you know it or not, on your vehicle. Um, if you're curious to see whether or not you have a, a CAN-enabled vehicle, um, you can do a voltage check on pin 6 and 14 on your diagnostic connector underneath your steering wheel. <clears throat> uh, network protocols such as FlexRay, LIN, most, uh, most being more of a, a high-speed um, solution for uh, multimedia applications within vehicles. Um, J1850, J1939 is actually the protocol used for um, the heavy trucking industry that sort of sits on top of CAN. Um, and then what we're looking at right here is actually um, a, a data bus diagram of the Mini Cooper itself. As you can see, there's actually four different networks here that are all interconnected um, with uh, with the actual instrument cluster, believe it or not, acting as the gateway. Um, and these systems are actually kind of segmented based on common functionality and information that they share between one another. So when we're talking about CAN, uh, controller area networks, um, it was actually developed by uh, Robert Bosch back in the 80s um, to actually, um, uh, as a method for basically communication between embedded systems um, with a uh, bus style topology um, within vehicles. Um, prior to CAN, um, a lot of the solutions for uh, networking embedded systems on vehicles um, sort of called for more of a ring style uh, mesh topology where nodes were sort of interconnected and dependent upon one another. So if one node were to fail, that could potentially affect the other node on the vehicle. And this was somewhat of a nightmare from a service technician's point of view trying to troubleshoot um, these networks. So CAN was actually designed to be a very um, uh, resilient um, networking protocol and uh, standard um, designed to withstand harsh operating environments such as the uh, heats and the, the colds, electromagnetic interference, um, those sorts of things. Um, and then automotive manufacturers from like Euro European automotive manufacturers were early adopters of the standard. So your BMW, Mercedes, uh, Volkswagen, Volvo, and those guys were early adopters of the standard. And CAN is actually a multi-master broadcast bus system. So the idea obviously being that if one node were to transmit a message, then all other nodes on the bus would actually receive that message. Um, whether or not a node actually processes that message is dependent upon um, something called access filters, I'm sorry, acceptance filters on the actual CAN controller itself. So if a message matches up with the actual acceptance filter, it then gets passed on to the uh, microcontroller for further processing. Um, otherwise, it's disregarded. Um, and there's, with CAN, there's no notion of um, source addresses. So it's nearly impossible to identify um, where a message actually came from, um, which is sort of a problem. Um, and CAN actually comes in two flavors. So there's the standard format, um, which is used on the uh, passenger automobiles. 
Um, and then there's the extended format. Uh, with the standard format um, that uses 11-bit uh, message ID. And then, uh, like I said, in the automotive, the passenger automobile um, world, these message IDs are actually proprietary. Um, but when we're talking about something like J1939, which is the protocol for the heavy trucking um, industry, um, it uses a 29-bit message ID. Um, and actually, this whole um, standard is fully documented. So if somebody was wanting to create a message um, designed to maybe override a brake controller, um, all they would have to do is refer to the Society of Automotive Engineers um, documentation for J1939 to construct such a, uh, such a message. Um, here's what a CAN frame looks like. Um, so with a uh, CAN frame, the actual payload portion of it um, is limited to up to eight bytes, um, which I thought was somewhat limited compared to like uh, stuff like uh, Ethernet, which can be up to 1,500 bytes. Um, and uh, so the way, um, one of the cool things about CAN is the way it handles arbitration. So if two nodes attempting to transmit at the same time, um, obviously perform a collision, um, the way it handles arbitration is based on the identifier, the message ID itself. So the idea being um, um, a node trying to transmit a message with a lower message ID um, has higher precedence than another node trying to transmit a message with a higher uh, message ID. And then the actual computer systems on um, CAN networks or vehicle systems for that matter, um, we call ECUs, electronic control units. Um, and these are designed to control a variety of features on the vehicle, everything from vehicle safety critical systems to non-safety um, critical systems. And these devices are, um, for the most part, programmable, um, which is nice from the uh, automotive manufacturer point of view, um, because if there's a flaw or vulnerability discovered um, within one of these devices, um, they can just push out you know, new firmware updates or patches or whatever, software updates, as opposed to physically re removing these devices. Um, and then the average modern day luxury vehicle um, has somewhere on the order, order of uh, 70 or so ECUs. All right, so let's get back to the actual CAN clock um, instrument cluster thing that I built here. Um, so what we want to do is we want to be able to um, manipulate the tachometer and the speedometer. Um, the problem with that is manufacturers don't publish the actual CAN IDs or specific payload information um, in order to manipulate these accordingly. Um, so uh, we actually use several methods to uh, actually figure out what's, you know, how we control the various functionality. The first one was we developed a method for visually correlating physical system interactions um, with identifiable patterns. And I'll, you'll see what I'm saying here in a minute. Um, but humans are inherently good at this. We're inherently good at seeing you know, patterns that we recognize on a graph, um, maybe something that's indicative of vehicle speed or engine speed. And then for the ones that we weren't able to use this method on, um, we use some simple fuzzing techniques um, to identify um, the various functionality that we're interested in. In my demo right now, the lighting is causing some issue, but afterwards, if you guys want to see this, I'll be out in the hallway or the chill out lounge, and I'll be happy to demonstrate it for you guys. And then, <clears throat> so um, the actual instrument cluster from the Mini Cooper was uh, salvaged from a wreck Mini Cooper um, that was involved in a stage automotive collision with a GMC Envoy. Um, before these uh, cars were actually involved in the automotive collision, um, they were outfitted with uh, um, external like instruments to measure such things as vehicle speed. And then we would correlate that data with the data on the CAN bus itself to verify its accuracy. Um, and this capture lasted for roughly, roughly 90 seconds. Um, and over the course of that capture, it gave us around 106,000 um, actual messages on the CAN bus. I'll show you guys that little the, the crash. Yeah, and as you can see, the the Mini Cooper didn't really stand much of a chance whatsoever. Um, oh, so we also actually hooked up a, uh, a data logger to the actual um, CAN bus itself to record all the messages, obviously, on the, tra on, the, um, on the bus. And then here's kind of the raw output of that, so message IDs and, and raw payload information. 
Um, and then we did like a unique, basically on all the message IDs to see, you know, which IDs actually occurred. And then um, a frequency count to see actually how many times a message was transmitted on the bus during that capture. And then we started to play with the ones that were most occurring um, first. Um, so back to the method of uh, visually identifying CAM messages of interest based on plotting the data on a graph. Um, if we're interested in vehicle speed, um, we basically um, will start, started to play with um, suspect message IDs. And then for each byte offset in the payload, um, we would plot the data until we saw something uh, uh, that was indicative of vehicle speed, um, such as the third one right here. And then for the, um, the tachometer, so if you notice in the video I just showed you, um, both of the cars were actually being um, pulled together like with a pulley system um, for the collision. So the actual engine speed itself was at an idle state the entire time. So we basically had to use some simple fuzzing techniques um, on the data fields of the suspect message IDs until the tachometer basically started flipping out of control and the needle started spinning like crazy. So that was kind of interesting. So up until now, we've actually um, identified, you know, the message IDs responsible for the speedometer and the tachometer, as well as the payload um, and the data offsets for those. So then we just built a, um, a simple CAM bus. Um, we used some 18-gauge wire, 220-ohm terminating resistors, 12-volt uh, power source, um, an Arduino with a CAN bus shield that had an MCP2515 CAN controller and an MCP2551 CAN transceiver. Um, the instrument cluster, obviously, and then a real-time clock module for implementing the clock functionality. And all this is available on our site, a uh, full step-by-step -step tutorial and procedure, uh, as well as the source code for this. And here's an image of what looked like early on in the prototyping stages. It's kind of a mess. And then as far as talking CAN with the Arduino, um, we just used a, a basically a CAN controller library that was designed to uh, communicate with the MCP. Uh, MCP 2515 that allowed us to construct um, basically can frames <clears throat> and then inject them onto the to the bus. And then um, so basically there's two modes of operation. There's the clock mode and then there's the demo mode. So demo mode being just like incrementing the speedometer and the tachometer. Like I said, I'll show you guys a demo um, afterwards if you're interested. So, you know, one might think, okay, so if you have physical access to the car anyways, you know, oh well. Um, but, you know, there's a bunch of possible scenarios in which case, like, uh, potential conspirators like service technicians and mechanics, um, car rental companies, coworkers, family, friends, ex-girlfriends um, could potentially have momentary uh, uh, access to your can bus or car, and they could attach a rogue ECU, um, kind of like the one I built here. Um, for less than $100, so that's kind of a problem. Um, and they could attach, whether that be to the, the OBD2 port um, underneath the steering wheel, or uh, tapping the CAN bus via vampire tap style, um, either under the hood or um, by some other means. Um, so what's surprising to me is that the actual um, access control, I guess, between um, ECU and ECU or network to network on vehicles is somewhat non-existent or the ones that have been are the ones that aren't in existence aren't very good and they have easily bypassed. Um, so maybe applying um, conventional network security um, techniques such as like maybe network intrusion prevention systems of some kind or some firewall methods um, to these networks um, might provide a better solution. Um, and then maybe some sort of like message anomaly prevention, depending on the context of other messages um, present on the CAN bus um, at the time. So maybe there shouldn't be a message that says, okay, um, someone's trying to uh, apply full throttle to the accelerator, but at the same time, um, they're trying to, you know, um, apply full pressure to the brakes. And then if you're... Uh, uh, if you're, in case you're interested in some of the research that we're doing, um, here's some links to our sites and some of the stuff that we're working on. Like I said, a full tutorial and source code is available um, on our site, so feel free to check out our stuff. And uh, I'll be out uh, roaming around, so if you see me around here, feel free to come out and um, ask me questions. If you have some questions or ideas or concerns, um, feel free to email me. 
Um, thank you very much. The collision uh, reconstruction fundamentals. Um, so we're very fortunate to have somebody with his caliber of expertise um, leading those efforts. And then before I came to TU, I was actually a, a cybersecurity analyst for uh, an information security firm in Tulsa, Oklahoma, uh, called True Digital Security. So who here in the audience remembers uh, Tim Burton's Batman Returns from like the early 90s? Okay, several of you. Good, good. Um, there's a scene actually in the movie where Batman parks his Batmobile um, behind a building in a back alley somewhere. Um, he then leaves it and takes off to, you know, attend to his crime fighting business. Um, and then all of a sudden, the uh, penguin um, and his gangster thugs sort of stumble across the Batmobile and um, they start playing with it. They start taking things apart. And then all of a sudden, they attach a, a little wireless gizmo to the Batmobile um, designed to interface with the actual computer systems on the car. Um, they basically reassemble everything. They take off. Batman comes back later on that night, um, hops in his Batmobile and goes off and leaves. Um, and then all of a sudden, the penguin kind of appears on the infotainment screen and says, gentlemen, start your engines. And then from that point forward, Batman is frantically trying to stomp on the brake pedal um, and as the penguin is um, basically wreaking, uh, wrecking havoc on the citizens of Gotham City. Um, a scenario such as that back then was somewhat near impossible, um, considering all the mechanical devices that were used to control the various um, components of the vehicle. Um, but today, a scenario such as that is actually uh, fairly realistic. Um, so what originally got me interested in vehicle networks, my name is Jason Staggs. Um, this is my uh, second time here at DEF CON. I was here last year at DEF CON 20. I uh, had a great time, met a lot of really cool people doing some really interesting stuff. And I'm just glad to be back again here this year to uh, uh, really live the experience. So the title of my talk is How to Hack Your Mini Cooper, uh, Reverse Engineering Controller Area Network Messages on Passenger Automobiles. Uh, so a little bit about me. Um, first and foremost, I am a graduate student of computer science at the Institute um, for Information Security at TU. Yeah. Um, right on. Uh, I'm also uh, currently finishing up my master's uh, thesis um, related to drive-by download attack mitigation. Um, I also have very strong research interests in network intrusion detection systems and uh, critical infrastructure protection, um, digital forensics, and most recently, uh, vehicle network security, uh, which I carry out through TU's Crash Reconstruction Research Consortium, um, which is directed by uh, Dr. Jeremy Daly, who's actually a professor of mechanical engineering um, who quite literally wrote the book on um, automotive 